The Lord be with you. And also with you. This is the eleventh Sunday after Pentecost as we gather together. The sermon is from Luke chapter 13 as Jesus answers a question about whether there, the number of people who are saved will be few by saying that the door to paradise is a narrow door. And then we begin with hymn 508, The Day is Surely Drawing Near.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your way. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes. He does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judge. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and perform your vows to the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Worthy is Christ the Lord, who was slain, whose blood set us Victor. 
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, you have called us to enter your kingdom through the narrow door. Guide us by your word and spirit, and lead us now and always into the feast of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Today's Old Testament reading comes from Isaiah chapter 66. For I know their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory, and I will set a sign among them, and from them I will send survivors to the nations, to Tarshish, Pool, and Lud, who draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the coastlands afar off that have not heard my fame or seen my glory. And they shall declare my glory among the nations, and they shall bring all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord on horses and in chariots and in litters and on mules and on dromedaries to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord. Just as the Israelites bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. And some of them also I will take for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain. From new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle is from Hebrews chapter 12. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom, 
and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is the word of the Lord. We stand for the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. Jesus went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Consider with me this morning one of the twelve disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, even called an apostle in Luke chapter 6, Judas Iscariot. We actually don't know a lot about him. We know his father's name was Simon. We know from his name, Iscariot, that he is a man of the city of Kerioth. That's what Iscariot means in Hebrew. And that's a city about 20 miles south of Bethlehem. We also know that he betrayed his Lord for 30 pieces of silver with a kiss. And betrayal implies closeness. Judas could betray Jesus because he was with him. He had met him. He actually knew Jesus In the flesh, for three years, they traveled together. Together, they traveled through the land of Judea. Together, they slept in cramped quarters or out under the stars. Together, they ate and drank. Together, they worked and taught and healed and proclaimed that the kingdom of God was at hand. Arguably, Judas's resume looks better than any of ours. He was even in charge of the money bag for Jesus and the rest of the disciples. And yet, despite that closeness, Judas abandoned his faith. Judas didn't make it. Today's gospel reading brings this warning directly home to each of us. That it's possible to have once shared in the things of God and yet not enter paradise. I can't give you the context behind our gospel conversation today, at least not as closely as I would like. We don't know who asked the question. We don't know why they asked the question. It's a downer of a question to begin with, almost as though they had just walked through the rough part of a town, observing open sin happening all around them on the streets, and then someone turned to Jesus in despair of all of the evil and said, Lord, will those who are saved be few? I could also see that question, though, coming from a position of pride, like that of the Pharisees, saying, now surely I'm in, but what about all these other people? Lord, will those who are saved be few? The Holy Spirit didn't consider it worth us knowing, as he didn't inspire Luke to record it. So instead, let us focus on what he did give us, the very words of our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. We learn from Jesus' answer that the door to paradise is narrow, slender, small, short, Now, we've reached the point in the year again where there are going to be crowds, hordes of people who seek to enter the gates of Arrowhead Stadium, pushing and shoving their way to get in. That's not the scene for the last day. There will be very few who seek to enter by this narrow door, while the rest are driven away into the pits of hell. Our gospel today isn't a parable. Jesus isn't making up a story in order to prove a point, to teach something to his disciples. No, our story today is a depiction of the day of judgment. That the master of the house, that is Jesus himself, will have shut the doors of paradise so that no more may enter. It's like the account of the ark in the Old Testament. That as long as Noah was still building that ark, that the gate or the door of the ark was sitting open. Repentance was possible. People could hear from the lips of Noah himself. They could hear the word of God's judgment. They could hear the word of God's salvation that would come through those waters. But they didn't. They could care less about the warning of God as they simply wanted to go about living their lives as usual. That is, until Yahweh shut the door of the ark. And then the rains began to fall. And the water began to rise upon the surface of the earth. And we can only imagine how many people may have banged on the side of that ark before perishing in the water. 
And so on the last day, Jesus is going to gather his people, his bride, his church to himself in his house, and then he's going to shut the door. And at that point, it is final. No one else can come in, no matter how hard they may try. Once they see the horror of hell that awaits them, no amount of banging on the door will matter. No excuse, no attempt to self-justify. It will be final. Jesus admits that they'll try anyway. Those banging on the door, those wanting to desperately avoid their own destruction will declare, we ate, we drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. Essentially, they make the case, we should be in because we know you, and you know us. They've listened to him. They've even dined with him. Why is he shutting the door before them? Just like Judas, there are many who will be cast aside on the day of judgment, who dined with Jesus and who heard him preach. Jesus in his ministry entered the homes of sinners and tax collectors and Pharisees. He healed all sorts of people. He preached in every town and in every village that he could find. But for many, this became a false confidence. I've met the Messiah, so I'm good. Yet in reality, they could care less about faith. They could care less about Jesus and his kingdom. They just went about their lives as usual. This text from Jesus is meant to be a warning to us. The epistle Pastor Otto read from Hebrews said that we will not escape the judgment if we reject him, that is Jesus, who has warned us from heaven. So let's review a basic of our faith for a moment. How are we saved? By faith, by grace. So faith is... Trusting in the Lord. Faith itself is a gift. We'll come back to that. Grace means gift. We are saved by the gift of God. We are saved by grace through faith is the language we see in Ephesians. Faith is a gift the Holy Spirit gives to us. Forgiveness, life, and salvation are gifts that our Lord Jesus gives to us that we receive by faith. These things aren't works. We can't earn them. Jesus himself has already earned them. He has paid for them by his own blood shed upon the cross. And now he simply seeks to give those wondrous gifts to you. But the gifts of Jesus aren't forced upon us. They aren't irrefusable. If you would rather have your life in this world, if you would rather live life as usual, Jesus will allow it but you will find the narrow door shut on the last day before you. Essentially, this is a warning against the idea of lawlessness, which has been around ever since Jesus ascended up into heaven. Lawlessness is the idea that once you have Jesus, well, the law doesn't matter anymore. That as a Christian, you're free. As a Christian, you can live however you want. You can do whatever it is you want to do, and you'll be fine. We see this idea many different ways today. I'll give you a few. One is the idea of doctrine, which simply means teaching. So many within the church today say the doctrines of the church don't matter. We're all Christians. We should just leave it at that. To say otherwise or to tell me that I'm wrong is to be unloving. That mindset, however, has bred so many falsities in the church. One of the common ones now these days, we've come to the point where many say that a loving God wouldn't possibly send anyone to hell. So everyone on the earth will be saved whether they believe in Jesus or not. There's a more dangerous one that tempts us within our church. In fact, as I drove home last night, I saw it on a church sign just on the way back to my house. Jesus accepts and loves me just the way I am. 
It is a deadly saying that is rapidly making its way through the church and destroying faith in its wake. People want to be able to go about their lives as usual. You can't look at my life and tell me the things that I love are wrong. Be prepared to be hated if you do. It's as though people actually believe that in the moment that they're baptized, that their pastor took one of those Monopoly get-out-of-jail-free cards and he slipped it somewhere down inside that baptismal garment. That they can now, from the moment of baptism until the time of their death, it doesn't matter what they do, it doesn't matter how they live, it doesn't matter what voices they allow to fill them, it doesn't matter who they serve, it doesn't matter who they love. No, to these people, come the day of judgment, they're going to be searching and checking all of their pockets, hoping to find that card to turn in. We ate and drank in your presence And you taught in our streets. When we stop and consider those words, they sound an awful lot like word and sacrament, don't they? Eating and drinking in his presence. Having him teach in our streets. Indeed, word and the sacrament are central and core to who we are as the church, as the people of God. So see how close this warning strikes to home. For us. Jesus ends his answer to the question by saying, some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. That's not a conversation about the different kinds of Christians and how paradise will have different types of levels and rewards. Not at all. Last, in those words of Jesus, means outside the church, whereas first in that sentence means in the church. So the last who will be first are the nations. They're the Gentiles. They are those who were apart from the Lord, who were apart from His promises. They were the last to hear the gospel. And yet some of them hear that good news and they believe and they become His people. They are gathered into His church, gathered together and given the place of honor at His table. They are first. But those that were first, the Jews to whom he gave his promises of old, some of them will be last. That is, they will no longer be a part of the faith. They will be cast out. That's the direction that Jesus will turn as the text continues in Luke 13, as he will lament over the city of Jerusalem with a text familiar to you, where Jesus says he longed to gather the people under his wings like a a hen gathers her chicks, but that they were not willing. I can see how the devil would use a text like this to bring doubt among us. That as Jesus speaks these words of judgment, that not everyone who seeks him will be saved, we begin to wonder what that means for us. And it appears to be a hope-shattering text. How do I know? How do I know if I'm saved? Lord, will those who are saved be few? Let me address the last question first. Comparatively speaking, yes, those who are saved will be few. In the world right now, there are roughly 8 billion people. And around a quarter of them, 2 billion people, claim to be Christian. Of those, that's simply the visible church, some of them will be the ones to hear these words of Jesus on the day of judgment. The door is narrow. Salvation is not the majority position in this place. But is the number of people who get to live forever with Christ in his paradise, dining at his table, actually few, as in only a handful, just a few? The answer to that is no. The Jehovah's Witnesses over the years popularized the idea that the Revelation 7, 144,000 was a literal number, that that was the few that would make it to be in paradise. They don't actually believe that anymore, but it's still a popular trending idea out there. It would be extremely shocking and depressing and despair-inducing if it were true, but it's not. 
Just a few verses later, John reveals to us that the number of the saints who were gathered around the throne of God was so numerous that it could not be counted with people who had been gathered from every nation, from every people, from every tribe, and from every language. In other words, paradise will be full. The new heaven and the new earth that Jesus is preparing for us even now will be full. And as our Lord Jesus said, people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. The door of paradise is open to you, O people of the west. But that's the shaken hope, doubt-driven, despair question raised in this text. How do I know that the door of paradise is open to me? And it's Simply this, by his death upon the cross, Jesus opened the doors of paradise to all people. Just like before the floodwaters came, the door or the gate of that ark was open to the world. Consider a few of the passages from Scripture. You know this one, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but... From Ezekiel 33, verse 11, As I live, declares the Lord Yahweh, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? And from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You've been invited by the waters of holy baptism, by the proclamation of the gospel, this faith has been made yours as the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You are the child of God. It's not something that you can earn. It's a gift that's already been paid for, a gift that is lovingly given to you, for you, from Jesus. And this isn't a competition The Pharisees typically had perfect church attendance, and yet many of them didn't make it. Here is the warning of the text. If you think you can live your life business as usual, spending your days doing whatever it is you please to do, and just say on the last day, but I know Jesus, it will end poorly for you. No, the door of paradise has been opened to you through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have been given a gift of infinite value, worth far more than anything this world could possibly offer you. Rejoice in this gift of faith. Treasure it. Treasure Jesus himself. Live in him. And spend your days doing the good works that God has prepared beforehand for you as a part of his family, that you would get to show others that Jesus has made the door of paradise open, even to them. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We stand for prayer.
Let us pray. Almighty, everlasting God, through your only Son, our blessed Lord, you commanded us to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, and to pray for those who persecute us. Therefore, we earnestly implore you that by your gracious working, our enemies may be led to true repentance, may have the same love toward us as we have toward them, and may be of one accord and of one mind and heart with us and with your whole church. Lord, in your mercy, almighty and most gracious God, we implore you to turn the hearts of all who have forsaken the faith once delivered to your church especially those who have wandered from it or are in doubt through the corruption of your truth. Mercifully visit and restore them, that in gladness of heart they may again take pleasure in your word and be made wise to salvation through faith in your Son, Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, Gracious Father, we implore you to hear us in the midst of our suffering in body and spirit, and we commend to you our brothers and sisters who need your grace and healing. We pray for Jim McConnell, Susie Shelp, Frank Beckel, Joyce Martin, Dennis and Chris Cromley, Mark Langsdale, Dave Fuchs, Richard Freoff, Carol Sanders, Glenn Lorai, Lori Kepsel, Donna Underwood, Mark and Deb Jones, Lynette Schilling, Ellie Torres, Luz Femright, Wally Schluter, Janet Stiegmeier, Kristen Kennard, Michelle Preisinger, Jackie Wesselsmith, Lucy Kettler, and those whom we name in our hearts. Minister to them in word and spirit. Bring to mind those promises that you have made, that they are in you and you are in them through the waters of holy baptism and your promise kept. We pray especially for those who mourn, we pray for those who give thanks for special occasions, especially for the Pignati family at the birth of a new granddaughter, Dakota. We recognize our responsibility in this world to receive and share the good news. We pray for your Holy Spirit to embolden us and that through the Spirit we would be granted words to encourage one another at home, at school, at work, and in our neighborhood, that we might bear witness to the living one, Jesus Christ, who holds the door open for repentance and hope everlasting. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, Trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who, having created all things, took on human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake he died on the cross and rose from the dead to put an end to death 
thus fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. We pray in his name and as he has taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
We stand. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul until life everlasting depart in peace. Lord, and sing his praise. Tell everyone what he has done. All who seek the Lord rejoice, and he bear his name. He recalls his promises and leads his people forth in joy. With shouts of thanksgiving, alleluia, We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you peace.
I too will praise him with a new song. This morning is our final day of family Sunday school that we've been holding throughout the summer. So we'll have a common opening, and then we'll divide the children into one room, and then the adults will remain with me as we explore Noah 
and his preparation uh, for their long 150-day journey upon the ark. This coming Wednesday begins our brand new season of midweek. So at 7 o'clock, there is going to be classes for adults, for 7th and 8th grade, for 5th and 6th, 3rd and 4th, K through 2, and child care. Now, if you have any questions about how things will go, our deaconess is coordinating our midweek and opening up, and you'll be able to visit with her on any Wednesday night. Uh, So that begins this week. Starting next week on Sunday will be the new format for Sunday school, so all of our regular classes with their regular teachers will be in place for next Sunday. You're also getting ready to start on September 6th, your Tuesday afternoon, John Knox Bible study. Not this Wednesday, but the following. I will be starting back up our Wednesday morning Bible study here at St. Matthew. We'll be studying from the book of James together. We have um, today, after the late service, we're going to meet in the gym, parents and children who are getting ready for confirmation this fall. So we invite our 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade families to attend if they can. Um, That'll be at 1230. We'll talk about what confirmation is, a little bit about what your class will look like, what my class will look like, and so forth. We do have a couple of events next Saturday evening that I want to share with you. One is a church movie night. So a few months ago, we watched the movie Sabina. We had some technical difficulties for that one, so prayerfully those won't occur again. But Sabina, which is a movie, it was actually a prequel um, about the coming to faith, the Spirit giving faith to Richard and Sabina Wormbrand, a husband and wife, um, and then how they became missionaries, sharing the gospel, and they were tortured and suffered for that faith of theirs um, during the Nazi uh, regime. We're going to watch this coming Saturday the technically sequel film, although it was released first, called Tortured for Christ, which focuses on the suffering of the husband, Richard Wormbrand, during his ministry. So we invite you to join us for that. It'll probably start 6.30 or so next Saturday evening. We'll make popcorn uh, and provide that as well. For our youth, they are welcome to attend that movie night and then stick around afterward for a lock-in. So next Saturday night, a youth lock-in for all of our high school youth. Uh, You're welcome to join us. Uh, Deaconess Sarah has the details on that one. She's been putting that together with a few adults to help out as well. I think that's it on our list of announcements. Are there announcements from anyone else this morning? On the last day, when we enter into the judgment room of God, many have heard it described this way, that you'll come, you'll be in a line waiting, and there's St. Peter with the book open in front of him, and when you get finally to your turn, he will ask you, why should I let you in? How many of you have heard that question before? What would you say? It's, a, it's really a trap of a question because anything that we try to answer to that question is just us trying to prove why we're worthy, which is exactly why we don't get into paradise. Paradise is a gift. Jesus has done it for us. He has already earned it and he gives it to us freely. Rejoice in that good news.